So here we are this evening, and we're going to actually spend all the time that we have uh, today looking at the brief career of just one man. And even at that, we are only going to be able to hit the highlights of what he accomplished in his short time at the head of the church. Unlike Katoigos Yaya, whom we saw last week, <laughs> the man who had to lead the Armenian church through the reign of five different emperors in the Byzantine government's 20 years of anarchy, Yeria's successor, our man for tonight, Hovhannes IV, also known more commonly as Hovhan, uh, Odznitsi, <clears throat> would spend his entire time in office under the reign of Leo III, uh, the, the Byzantine emperor who puts in place the iconoclastic policies as we mentioned last time. And in fact, Leo is going to outlive the Katoigos by 13 years. So for Hovhannes, having his reign coincide with that of Leo, they begin actually their reigns in the, at the same moment, um, means that he is going to be involved right at the very beginning of the first stage of the controversy over icons. In fact, he won't even see the, so the Hofan won't even live to see the actual edict that put that ban on the use of icons in place. Nor could he know that in spite of the discord that followed on that uh, edict, the emperor would stick by it. So the fact that Hovhannes's relatively short reign, just from 717 to 728, the fact that that shorter reign is pivotal for the Armenian Christian identity means that he somehow, whether it was by grace, by wisdom, was able to kind of feel what was happening in the air before it happened he was able to position Armenian Christianity in such a way that his successors would be able to deal with the controversy. They wouldn't have to invent a method for dealing with it. He would already have it in place. So let's talk for a bit about the various forces that he had to take into account as he was making his decisions about what Armenian Christianity would, could, and should look like going forward. Katoigos Hovan led the Armenian church at a time when Arab control over Armenia was firmly established. He is part of the generation that cannot remember a reality prior to Islamic domination. And yet there still was within Armenian society a pretty large pro-Byzantine element whose fondness for the neighboring Christian empire and whose unshakable faith that it would rise again despite its reduced size and power, despite its great losses to the Islamic world. Their love for that empire, their inability to kind of um, see that perhaps its days were over as a valuable ally for them could easily destabilize what was happening in Armenia. And it would. In fact, it already had been the case when, as you remember, we talked about as retaliation for a rebellion. Armenian nobility who had taken the Byzantine side, who had tried to reestablish Byzantine rule in Armenia caused the death of many of their noble compatriots who were herded into the churches in Nachichevan and burned. And later on, we're going to see several more examples of this same problem of people trying to, to live the present out of what had worked in the past. So for the Katoigos, this is a quandary. How is he going to navigate between 
these two powers, first of all, the actual Islamic overlords of Armenia and the nostalgic overlords who still had the heart and mind of many of the people. And how is he going to balance the needs of those two portions of the Armenian population, those who did and those who did not favor finding a way to get along with Islam as a permanent presence. It was a very interesting kind of knot of conundrums. What could he do that would please the Islamic authorities without necessarily alienating the Byzantine neighbors to a point um, where things would become ugly? How could he convince Armenians of differing political persuasions that he, as Katoigos, had the power, the authority, and the prestige to lead them all, or as we're going to see in a few minutes, most of them at least, both by nature and by policy. Hofhan chose to address these issues by first of all, living a wholly ascetic life. What was expected of a monk in his time. And according to a later Katoigos and historian, Hovanes V, Katoigos of Draschana Gert, Hovan was above criticism in this regard. The historian Katoigos writes of Hovan with virtuous energy, he industriously devoted himself with disciplinary effort. He armed himself with spiritual deeds, with fasting and prayer and nightlong vigils. And he did not wear wool next to his skin, meaning something soft, but penitential garments of goat hair. And we'll come back to the goat hair in just a minute. So the integrity of his faith life, the, the fact that his standards as a monk were not compromised by the potential his position would have given him to live a life that was more in tune with the secular prerogatives of power, his ability to keep to who he was, to maintain his life as a monk while he was on the Catholic coastal throne, won him the support of many people. At the same time, however, the Catholicos realized that many other people would not interpret his pious minimalism as a sign of power or a source of authority. So he also, while maintaining what we see here on the slide, maintaining all of this, he also behaved in a way that would be more impressive to people who equated power with the prominent display of luxury. And so the Katoigos historian writing about him also adds, this follows directly from what we saw on the slide previous, all the while he decked himself externally in garments of noble colors and with powdered gold mixed with unguents and perfumes, he sprinkled his frothing beard which fell to the pockets of his garment. That's quite an impressive set of facial hair. And thus attired, he convened councils so that his appearance might be a cause of joy to well-intentioned viewers who would enjoy seeing the prestige of the Armenian patriarch. While for immature evildoers, his appearance might cause an awe that would awaken them from evil to good. In other words, the people who are impressed with this kind of thing, seeing him use it well, might be won over to his side, won over to his policies, and thus move from potentially dangerous and damaging activities to supportive ones. Now, apparently, <clears throat> Hofan's appearance his choice to have one persona internally 
but very clearly present versus his choice to use the trappings of power publicly. This gained him some notoriety. <laughs> you can imagine if you have one meeting with a Catholicos who has a white beard down to the pockets on his garment, completely like covered in sparkling gold dust, it would leave an impression. But this combination served Hovhan very well in his opening gambit with the Muslims. When he became Catholicos, the same year, the very pious and also ascetically inclined Khalif Omar ibn Abdelaziz ascended to the leadership of the Islamic empire. You can see his piety is demonstrated in his coinage. There are no depictions. He is not anywhere on it. There's simply the inscription. And interestingly, Ahmad would only continue in power for three years. So it's kind of fortuitous that he overlapped with Hofan right at the beginning of both the reigns because it gave Hofan the opportunity to go to Damascus, possibly at the invitation of the, the caliphate, in order to congratulate the newly seated caliph. Not only was this a polite thing to do, but it could also be advantageous because it was customary for potentates to grant favors upon their accession. And Hovan hoped to be able to obtain from Omar assurances that the church's rights and privileges would be respected. In other words, he was hoping to use Islamic influence again to increase the status and the potential of the church. So for this visit, according to the story, Khalif Omar specified that he wanted to see Katoigos Hovhan in full regalia, as described in the text we just read. He wanted to see the colorful garments, he wanted to see the gold dust, he wanted all of that. And this meeting was facilitated by the Arab governor of Armenia at the time, a man named Walid, who was himself very much impressed with the Katoigos and thought that Omar would also like to meet him. And it was an interesting interview because Omar was a man who was noted for his simplicity of life. He kept his lifestyle minimal in order to remind him of the simple past that his ancestors had come from as desert dwellers. And so when he had his interview with the Katoigos, he was very much interested to hear how it could be that someone who was a follower of the humble Jesus could go around dressed up like that. It's a good question. And it gave the Katoigos an opening. The story carries on to tell us that the Katoigos offered to explain this unusual looking phenomenon to the Khalif if he would ask people to step outside the audience chamber just for a moment so that the two of them could be alone. And I suppose Omar sized up the Catholicos as being a non-dangerous person, and he was intrigued enough to agree. So when they were alone, Hofan said to Omar that Jesus and the apostles, the early fathers, had asserted their authority through the miracles that they performed. Hofan, having no miraculous powers himself, no miracles to his credit, was forced to resort to external things in order to impress the people who look at the outward man. And he then showed the Khalif that his undergarment was actually a penitential hair shirt. I was able to find a picture of one for you. It's made of goat hair woven the wrong way. If you've ever petted a goat, <laughs> their hair is spiky. 
And so having that next to the skin would be a constant reminder of the discomforts of the body. And it was used partly as a, a way of keeping alertness, being able to stay awake in order to accomplish more in prayer and reading and so on. Well, out of his respect for Hovhan's understanding and for the way he used the iconography of power without losing who he was internally, Omar agreed that the Christians in Armenia would not be pressured to change their faith, that the Armenian churches, Armenian priests, Armenian deacons would not be subject to taxation, and Christians would be able to continue to worship publicly, freely. These are big concessions. And so in return, Hovan promised the full cooperation of Armenian Christians with the Muslim regime. And he must have had just a little bit of trepidation promising this, knowing some of his constituents back home. But one does what one needs to do. And so he returned home to his seat with a military honor guard and many gifts, in addition to the concessions that he had received. Then in keeping with his promise, the Catholicos did engineer the removal of Byzantine officials and military personnel who had been staying in Armenia. This is also a smart move from one point of view because it makes it harder, it undercut their ability to influence pro-Byzantine nobles to rebel. On the other hand, it was a calculated risk because it means a break with the Byzantine government. As part of his greater plan also to differentiate Armenian Christianity from its Byzantine counterpart. Hovan was also very zealous in weeding out Byzantine influences in Armenia's religious life. So although there are a couple of phrases that remain in the Badarak, um, other things went. And these actions did not endear the Catholicos to the pro-Byzantine group in Armenia, but in the end, these changes that he makes, these things that he removes, stuck. So they resonate with Armenians. For example, he eliminated the use of leavened bread for the Eucharist. And lo and behold, we still use unleavened bread in the Eucharist. Although there may have been some objection at the beginning, Armenians adapted quickly to the new mode and have kept it ever since. He also eliminated foods that were allowed by Byzantine tradition for fasting, such as fish, oil, wine, and lo and behold, Armenian fasting regulations continue to call for not using fish, oil, or wine, even though at least the wine, and maybe also sometimes the oil, is clearly a plant product. In other words, history bore out the effectiveness of the Catholicos' reforms. And interestingly, some stories later sprang up with kind of additional verification that his stance had been correct. So there's the later, much later historian Vatan Adevilci tells a story that um, Emperor Leo, not being pleased with the Katoigos' obvious willingness to cooperate with infidels, sent a messenger to the Katoigo state to complain about this. The story goes that the messenger became ill. Doctors came, doctors could do nothing for him. The situation was dire. And the Katoigos came to see him 
laid his hand on him and he was healed. And so the messenger went on to become a monk in Armenia for the remaining 15 years of his life. Now, whether or not there's any truth to this tale, it does show that the Katoigos got away with this calculated risk that he took in moving farther away from Byzantine influence in the interests of establishing Armenian Christianity as its own thing. But there is more to Katoigos Oznitsi's determination that while yes, they might, they probably should, make their peace with foreign domination and adapt to the political situation as it actually was. Armenians as a church, he was absolutely certain, must be distinct, united, and not, not compromise their faith and their character in any direction, whether that be with Islam, with the Byzantines, or with a growing grassroots anti-church movement that we will talk about momentarily. So changing obvious things that up until this time had unified Armenian and Byzantine practice like fasting foods and Eucharistic bread, that was a step, but it didn't constitute a new Armenian identity. And what Katoigos Hohan was aiming for was something that would empower Armenian Christians to be friendly with, but independent of others to such an extent that there would be no question of whether an Armenian was just a Greek Christian by some other name, there would be no question whether the Jesus of Islam was just the same as the Jesus of Christianity. No, Armenian Christianity would have its own character. This is an interesting vision that he has. And his independent mindset in a way makes sense when we look at where he came from. The area around Otsun looks bucolic, placid, flat, seemingly an endless plain ringed by mountains. Very beautiful. But it is actually much more than it seems. It is situated truly in a kind of splendid isolation at the top of a huge gorge that you can see to the left of the picture. And you can see it winding around and kind of framing the green fields. And up this huge gorge, if one wants to go to Odzun, one has to wind one's way laboriously for a number of minutes. And fortunately now, <laughs> because you really can, if you're not being observant of where you are, you really can walk way too close to the edge here. That edge is now marked with a hachkar, appropriately enough considering what Hohan is going to do with the rest of his life. Odzun has an ancient church. I like this close up of the hachkar. You can see the inscription underneath it. And this ancient church kind of sits in its own meadow surrounded by the village and the gorge. And around this very ancient church is a fascinating graveyard, which has been studied on its own. And with many interesting features to its architecture that have accrued over a long history that has been punctuated by restorations and renovations, including this recent one. This church has been very lovingly maintained. And so what looks like a flat surface from one side 
So you can clearly kind of see the classic Armenian architecture of it. Actually, from the other side, and you can see there used to be a smaller chapel attached. From the other side, it actually includes a cloister. And the doors of the church, as the priest who serves there was happy to point out, are particularly ancient. Like this one with that very simple cross carving above the door, probably, he said, fifth century. And a number of inscriptions crowded around it. Or this one where you can still see some of the decoration that once framed this doorway. So in other words, even in the eighth century, going into this church must have felt like stepping back in time. There was a living connection between this structure and the etymology of the name of the town, according to some which had to do with the, the fact that St. Thomas had passed through this area and consecrated clergy, odzelling them. Once inside this church too, an observant worshiper looking up would realize that he was standing, he or she, in the center of a cross. And you can imagine that if you were to, to cut along the lines of these pillars and then kind of fold the building out, you would create a cross. And as the atmosphere of this church and this place that helped to form Katoigos Hohan into the clergyman that he became. So what did he choose as the pillars of Armenian Christian identity? What did he put his influence behind in order to promote the construction of this new identity? Well, first of all, to achieve a unique, independent, and unifying Armenian Christian identity, Katoigos Hofan focused on the liturgy. And this wasn't totally according to the story. This is not completely a cerebral idea of his. We're told that he was prompted to an interest in liturgical reform. <laughs> by a disastrous debacle of a service that took place when early in his reign, choirs from different parts of Armenia, different parishes came together in order to, to celebrate what was supposed to be a glorious liturgical event. <laughs> and it turned out to be anything but. It's <laughs> not hard to imagine uh, how that might happen when we consider the differences between Ejmiadzin tradition singing and Jerusalem tradition singing, for example, that difference is significant even in this day and age of shared musical notation and a lot of cross-pollination between places. So what would it have been like in a time without those advantages? Well, as the choirs began to sing, it became painfully obvious that the melodies for the same sharagan were different in each location. Services might be done in slightly different ways. Wording might be somewhat different and local preferences basically reigned. So instead of a harmonious, unified, beautiful service, the result was absolutely inharmonious cacophony. And the Katoigos knew then and there that something had to be done about that because this would be a terrible witness 
if Armenians coming together could not find a basis could not already have and be solid on a basis for a harmonious and uplifting expression of the faith, then how are they going to express that faith to other people? It was not possible. So on the one hand, the Katoligos reformed and standardized liturgies and music. On the other hand, he worked very hard for the education of priests and deacons in particular about the meaning and the rationale of the liturgies that they were performing, but also about the exact way that things should be done. Not because that was according to some divine plan that he had realized, but, but simply because everything needs to be in good order. And so you have to pick someone's way of doing it. And Katoligos Hovan himself wrote rather extensively on liturgical matters, putting practical details behind his general dictum that all Armenians should celebrate their services in the same way. Beyond that, in the two volume book of canons of the Armenian church, the Ganon Akir, which he edited, his canons are almost the only ones that were promulgated to legislate liturgical details. And they can be very detailed indeed about what is read, what is said, when, in what sequence, and so on. So his canons are very interesting to anyone who wants to know more about how liturgy in the eighth century was celebrated. Okay, so liturgy that was recognizably and consistently Armenian was essential in Katoligos Hovan's view to creating an Armenian Christian identity. No one walking into an Armenian church service should be in any doubt about where he or she was. You should know immediately it's an Armenian church, it's an Armenian liturgy. So that would be a good step. But there was more that the Katoligos wanted to achieve for this identity. And in this, he is quite prescient, I think. In order to create a uniquely recognizably Armenian expression of Christian faith, the Katoligos' second focus was on finding an image, a depiction that could symbolize not just the essence of the faith, but that could become a vehicle for its full exegesis, for full explanation, for that you could something that you could pack into it much more significance than the image itself had. If I can explain that. What he hoped was to be able to prevent Armenian Christians from being sucked into the disorder that is going to soon follow when the Byzantine state bans icons. So on the one hand, he wants to, to save Armenians or prevent them from being drawn into a controversy that they that is not going to go well or go anywhere as far as he can foresee. While at the same time making it abundantly clear that the Armenian church does not at all buy into the very, shall we say, simple minded and literalistic mindset of another sector of the Armenian population who wanted not only to do away with icons, but to do away with the church. They had no use for the church's liturgies, which are ways to mark the sacredness of things, whether it be the death of Christ that we mark with the Eucharist, or life's major moments. For example, the sacraments of uh, birth, marriage, death, ordination. 
in this part of the population's understanding, if something was not explicitly described in the New Testament, they had no use for it. There should be no growth, no development, and no change from whatever applied as they read it to the churches that were founded by St. Paul. Now in Armenia, the main representatives of this, to my mind, rather flat and one-dimensional way of looking at the faith had a name and had an identity. They were called Paulicians. When their protest against all things church began, well, we don't even know when it began, but with or without the specific name Paulician being mentioned, they were condemned at the Council of Devine in 554, the same one that uh, did away with Chalcedon in Armenian circles. That council was held under Nishas the second Ashtaragetsi, and they were condemned again at a council about a hundred years later under Katogos Nersas the third. But they were still a recognized and influential group in the middle of the seventh century, it seems, because Hofhan's predecessor, Yeria, also condemned them in a joint council that he held with the Caucasian Albanian Katoigos. So in other words, <laughs> condemnations um, and other measures taken against this grassroots movement had not helped. Instead of dying out, they were growing. And to get ahead of ourselves just a little bit, the condemnations that Hofan and his bishops would unleash against them didn't help either. <laughs> Later in the eighth century, the Paulicians were making pretty great headway in Armenia and they would go on doing so. You can see on the map, the cities of Samosata and Argaun. Paulicians were plentiful in these Southern areas, also down into Mamistra, Mamestia. But it wasn't just a Southern kind of former Byzantine territory phenomenon. There were also many of them up here in Mananari, in the Northwest of Armenian territory. And our information about them is not extensive because history is written by the winners after all. But we do know of an early ninth century Paulician figure named Sergius, who took the name Tychicus, naming himself for a disciple of St. Paul. And we know that in 801, he founded a church that he called the Church of the Colossians. And then he led a mission into Cilician territory in order to found the church that he called the Church of the Ephesians. So it seems that at least in his time, this movement considered themselves as the true Christian successors of St. Paul. And then in the middle of the ninth century, another Paulician leader named Carbeas would make this place called Tefrike, or now Devrigi, into a fortified stronghold for them. This is not a movement that is pacific in any way. They were significant militarily. They had social, a social network of services. And they were significant enough, here you can see more of the fortification walls of their town and in the front, the ruins of a church. They were significant enough presence that in the middle of the ninth century, the Empress Theodora, we mentioned her last time as uh, ethnically Armenian, the woman who restored icons to honor once and for all, unleashed a fierce pogrom against them which in a way, I'm sure it was not, not pleasant at the time, but it was a very backhanded kind of a compliment 
to the size and influence of their movement, not only in Armenia, but in Byzantium as well. And in a funny kind of way, it seems that their growth and their spread was fed by some ambivalence in the government about them because their military ability, their military discipline and prowess was very needed. So on the one hand, the government doesn't love their attitudes towards Christianity as it is developed, but on the other hand, they kind of need them for their military capacities. And so some of them were transplanted by the Byzantine government to what's now Bulgaria in order to hold the border region there. And they remained there. When you billeted out of the army, you were often given territory to farm for yourself. And so their ideas spread even further. So this is a battle that Hovhannes or Hovhan Katolgos is not going to win. Nonetheless, out of it came things that are very essential to us today as we think of ourselves as Armenian Christians. So in a way too, we should take into account that his decision to favor the liturgy was also um, intended as a statement against Paulicianism. People who had no use for the, the sacraments of the church who did not realize that Eucharist and the rest of those things are not frivolous. They're not just things that were thought of, oh, well, you know, it would be really nice to, <laughs> to uh, make people come and do these ceremonies. There were not things that could be, these portions of our lives, these important moments should not be approached without reverence. And so by enhancing the liturgy and focusing on the liturgy, the Catholicos is saying, no, they are not right when they say that these things don't matter. They do. They are a way that we interact with our faith and we express it in our own time. He also chose to defend the use of icons, which Paulicians considered as a type of idolatry. And in his writing, the Catholicos clearly differentiated, as other people in fact had done before him, that no one who is thinking in any way worships the board on which the icon is painted. No one worships the paint, no one worships the depiction itself, but instead the presence that it represents. But while he defended the use of icons, the Catholicos did not push for them. He didn't make a case for them as essential to worship in any way. He didn't begin having them used processionally or venerated in kind of a handheld manner. Instead, he chose to differentiate Armenians from Paulicians and others <coughs> by focusing on the cross as the ultimate symbol of Armenian Christianity. <clears throat> so when he chose to make the cross the image par excellence of Armenian Christianity while not legislating against the use of icons, he was delivering a very carefully calibrated blow to the Paulician way of doing things. He tells us in one of his writings that in his time, the Paulicians had gone beyond the fight against icons to the fight against the cross, which they saw as, I quote, the enemy of God, the instrument for the murder of Christ. So, rather than venerating any physical cross, they said, the true crucifixion, the true Eucharist, are the believer, him or herself. Now this is a, a different thing from saying that humans are, are in the image of God. <laughs> it's gone to a step 
several steps farther by saying that there can then be no other visual expressions besides the human, which is, you know, as we all know, often a quite tarnished image. And so Hovhaness is also pushing back against that and saying, no, the cross is not the enemy of Christ, is not the enemy of God. The cross was part of the plan of salvation from the beginning. You can see it in all of the scriptures. Of course, they didn't use the Old Testament scriptures, but you can, <clears throat> you are taking away something which is actually crucial to our understanding of who we are, who God is, and how we relate. And just as a, a little kind of a footnote, Katogos Hovan was ahead of his time in this. In the middle of the eighth century, a couple of generations after his death, a synod of Constantine V confirmed the condemnation of icons that Leo III had issued. And at that point, images of saints in Hagia Sophia and Hagia Irene, big churches in Constantinople, were replaced with an image of the cross, an utterly plain image as something that would be acceptable to those who did not support the use of icons. So in their own way, the Byzantines would also begin to focus on the cross, at least for this particular time period. So by neither endorsing nor condemning icons, but instead making the cross the symbol of Armenian faith, the ultimate divine sign, the ultimate Suth Nishan. Katoigos Hovan was not just choosing to differentiate the Armenian church from the Paulicians and other groups, although he is going to accomplish that. He was actually also tapping into something that was already very deeply rooted in Armenian consciousness. On the spot where St. Thaddeus and Bartholomew's evangelical paths crossed and where they had a famous meeting and discussion with one another over the progress of their work in the Armenian population, a monumental cross was set up known as Otiats Chach, the overnighting place where you spend the night cross. Now it's very near the monastery of Khorbira and it is a revered holy site in its own right. Other famous crosses involved in the very early history of Armenian Christianity included the cross of St. Hripsime, which we are told she left in this place, the monastery at Varak, which continued to exist until just shortly after the genocide. Here you see Armenian orphans who were housed there. This monastery was home to the relic of the cross that she brought almost to Armenia. And as you know, this is a relic that has its own feast day in the calendar, a feast that's unique to the Armenian church. The cross, even in fragmentary form, is important. The Jivari Monastery in Georgia was built to commemorate the monumental cross that was set up by Hripsime's companion and a survivor of their uh, martyrdom, Nune, as a sign of her evangelization of Georgia. So the cross is fundamental to the earliest stories of the Christianization of Armenia. And so Katoligos Hovan is fully in line with Armenian tradition when he made the cross into a truly national religious symbol. 
And it's interesting to see that, in fact, he was not the first person to think in this direction. He simply carried the thinking several steps farther, faster. Katoigos Sahak Tsoroporetsi, who we spoke about in a couple of sessions ago, had already enriched the celebrations of the Feasts of the Cross with many hymns, some of them beloved and famous like Zorotun Suprachi or the Derhek Mits of the Navagadik of the Feast of the Cross. And these hymns make it abundantly clear that already in Katoiko Sahak's mind, the cross was the summation of theology. And although his hymns are simple in language, they communicate this idea quite well. And it's probably worth remembering that music is one of the three modes of Armenian Bartabedutun, Armenian theology. In addition, Katoigos Hovhan's own early education probably also predisposed him to see the unifying symbolism that the cross could empower Armenians with. It's quite possible that he studied here in what is now the Yerevan suburb of Avon at a school that was attached to the Holy Mother of God Monastery. This is what's left of it. In his time, it was a premier institution of higher learning. There are other candidates for the location because almost all early churches were named for the Mother of God and there were a lot of them in this area, but this seems to be a likely candidate. Hovhan's mentor and the head of this school was a man named Theodoros Kirtenavor. Theodore, the man who wore sackcloth, which reminds one of the hair shirt that Hovhan Katoigos would later use. Kirtenavor then meant an ascetic monk, or maybe if we were putting it in today's vocabulary, a minimalist monk. Theodoros had quite the pedigree. He was related to two Katoigoses, not just one. On his father's side, he was related to Katoigos Gomidas, the early seventh century. On his mother's side, he was related to Gomidas's famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, Katoigos Yezer. He was also very well informed in Greek. And when you read his writings, he has an impressive quantity of vocabulary that he created based on words in Greek or that he outright created in order to express ideas that um, he wanted to have exactly so. He must have been an interesting teacher. But Theodoros wrote one of the earliest encomia in other words, discourses of praise on the Holy Cross. And he composed hymns for the Feasts of the Cross as well. And it appears that for him, the cross was the symbol, first and foremost, of the genuineness of Christ's humanity. It was essential to Theodoros's understanding of the faith that the death of Jesus was a real death. Death is the human experience of all human experiences. But it was also true in his view that the cross's true nature encompassed much, much more. And so in his encomium in his discourse of praise, he describes the cross as being in its reality, not, not in its appearance, but in its, its internal reality, its historical reality, its um, 
the reality of its powerful interaction with human life. He describes it as being around 14 different things. There are, all of these are ingredients in what makes the cross truly a powerful symbol and spiritual reality. First of all, he said, the cross is a tree. Replacing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in paradise with a tree whose fruit, Christ, is totally good. The cross is also, he said, a vine. A vine that the prophet Isaiah in, his fifth, in the fifth chapter of his work describes as having been lovingly by God in every possible way. It was a symbol of the human race in and of itself, nurtured by God, offered by God so many evidences of divine care, and yet becoming an instrument of death. Theodoros calls the cross again and again the mute intercessor, the an barbar parejos. He described it as in its spiritual reality being the Ark of Noah, remembering that the flood brought death to those outside the Ark, but not to those within it. He described the cross as being an altar set up by God the same way that Abraham had set up an altar to sacrifice his son Isaac. And as it was true in Isaac's case, so it was also in God's that the son himself carried the wood for the sacrifice. Theodoros also describes the cross as a ladder connecting heaven and earth, remembering the vision of Jacob in the book of Genesis, where he is fleeing, feeling abandoned by God, fleeing from the presence of his brother whom he has cheated. And he sees in his dream that there is a connection between the exact place where he lies with his head pillowed on a stone and the door of heaven and that angels come and go freely between the two spheres. He is not, in fact, alone. Theodoros also describes the cross in terms of a very strange story also about Jacob, that tells us how when Jacob had made an agreement with his father-in-law that all of the one colored sheep would belong to the father-in-law and all of the spotty sheep would belong to himself, he used peeled rods in order to make sure that the genetics of his sheep predominated gaining for himself the offspring of his father-in-law's flocks. In the same way, Theodoros maintains, the cross changes our coloration to identify us as sheep of God. He also describes the cross as the doorposts in the story of Exodus, on which blood was smeared so that the angel of death would pass over Israelite households and take only the firstborn children of the Egyptians. The cross is Moses' staff, bringing life to the sick. It was the pillar of cloud and fire that led the Israelites in the wilderness. It was the wood that Moses threw into a spring of bitter water to make it sweet. Theodoros also describes the cross as the tablets of the new divine law, 
not written in stone, but written on human hearts. The cross is a crown, a glory, and it's also a seal, something that marks us as the property of God, a seal that we place on our mouth, the seal that we place on a grave, whether it's in the burial service or in the chachkad that is put up to mark the grave. So in choosing the cross as the rallying point of Armenian faith, Katoigos Hovan was also being true to his own teaching, to his own upbringing, following in the footsteps of his predecessors. He was not inventing something new. He was seeing the potential in something that was already there. And he was also thinking in harmony with his own contemporaries. A certain David, also wrote a great encomium on the cross at around the same time. And a young thinker named Stephanos, who later became the bishop of the province of Sunik, the son of a priest who was serving in Devine, and so he was trained at the Katoi Gosel residence school as well as in the Byzantine world. The Stephanos also wrote a very complex and beautiful piece on the cross. So in other words, the time was ripe for this idea. The time was right for this expression of Armenian faith to come into its own. And as we know, it stuck. It has stood the test of time. Hovan Eskatoigo spent the last days of his life not far from Odzun, here in a little monastery that's now named Surbanes in recollection of his name, returning there to the simplicity of his monastic roots. In quiet and in contemplation. But the cross that he championed went on to become the exegetical tool of Armenian faith second to none. It became everything that Theodoros and the others had claimed for it. It went on to express more, to mean more, to intercede more, to incorporate more things into the understanding of itself. To become more and more inclusive, complex, nuanced, and layered. and to do this in more places than Katoigos Hovhan and his contemporaries could ever have imagined. 